Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 5th, 2020, are these. An Old Testament reading, a complimentary one, Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. Another Old Testament reading, this one, the semi-continuous one from Genesis 24, many selected verses, Psalm 145, 8 through 14, Romans 7, 15 through 25, and the gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 11, 16 through 19, and 25 through 30. Conveniently passing over several woes that Jesus pronounces. You can include them if you like. It's always fun to say woe. It is fun to say woe. But they did, uh, the, yes, they did leave those out. And uh, so I'm just going to go right to the verse that, uh, that I think will uh, be very um, touching for people and really wonder, like, how, how, do we, how do we experience this verse here and now, um, given the, the last uh, realities of, of, of our last month's realities of our world. And uh, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So um, I'm wondering what you all are, how would you preach that verse? How would you talk about that verse? Um, in this, uh, this time around, three years later. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've been um, talking with people about and just so struck by, and you know, you know this theoretically, and, and Joy and I teach this all the time in our class about, you know, the contextuality of scripture and how deeply, obviously deeply, our interpretation is affected by our context. And, uh, but there's also these moments in time uh, when, when the, when, when we will, when we will talk about the, a, a pre-COVID interpretation, for example, and a post-COVID, that's certainly not, not limiting to the pandemic, but how, how different texts sound, uh, because of this moment in time, both before and after. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of those texts for me. Uh, this particular verse. It might be that I that I have some um, latent memories of this verse uh, from from my ministry. But uh, but yeah, I'm wondering what you all where you might land with this. I mean, how um, how would you talk about this verse, or how do how do we need to think about this verse? And that's not to take it out of context, but it will be taken out of context and. Uh, and that might be one solution is to put it back into its context, and I get that. But I, I do think it's a verse that's worth pondering, particularly, particularly being able to think about with people the way in which uh, the way in which texts sound just extraordinarily different in um, particular contexts. Anybody? That's a good question. It's it's hard to answer. For July 5th, partly because we're recording this about a month in advance and the world seems to be changing every 12 hours. Um, so I have no idea what life's going to look like on July 5th. I'll just say that right now. But in my experience, I'll try to be quick. Two things, and they both have to do with anger and stress. And one is my experience, both because of the pandemic, also because of the, the consequences of, of the killing of George Floyd which is where we're sitting right now as we record in those consequences. And I suspect they'll still be here in July. A lot of people are, are mad and embarrassed at uh, nation, church, denomination, um, neighborhood. And I'm speaking for myself here and, and probably a lot of other uh, white people. And there's a kind of just restlessness that's born out of a how in the hell are we still in this or i thought we had fixed this which uh you know is is I, i'm projecting probably not joy's perspective on this and certainly isn't the perspective of others i've talked to but i, I do worry about 
this kind of cycling anger that's justified and righteous, but if it causes people of goodwill and of faith to turn on each other, it's going to be really destructive. The second thing I think of is I have a, a pastor I know who is gearing up for guiding a congregation into the fall with the strategy of people are going to get angrier as every week goes on. And this pastor started saying that way back in May, um, precisely because of the pandemic and being denied the opportunity to gather for worship, which is getting old for a lot of people, but also with the presidential election in this country coming closer, that anger is going to be in the air more and more and more. And anger, again, can be a righteous thing, can motivate us to action, but can also be really toxic in communities if it causes us to turn on each other or to demand things from each other that are unreasonable. So I hear this text to kind of take a deep breath for a minute, right? Remember where your core is, where your source of identity resides in Christ, and remember that that's first and foremost a promise of refreshment. Yes, there's work to be done, but if we lose that sense of welcome, belonging, refreshment, we're going to tear each other apart and set us back. By us, I mean whatever you want it to mean uh, a long way. So that's what I hear. Um, I want to build on that. Um, but first, I think I know why Caroline likes this passage from, uh, from Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through um, at least 27. It's because Jesus sounds like he's from the Gospel of John for a minute there. <laughs> right? All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone who the Son reveals him. Right? Doesn't that sound like John? Totally. But then, he, <laughs> but then he goes back and he suddenly sounds like the Jesus from Matthew. Come to me, all that are weary and carrying heaven burdens, and I will give you rest. I mean, that. Uh, so uh, I want to build on what Matthew said about, uh, what Matt Skinner said about um, anger. And I think broadly in the scripture, there's two types of anger. Uh, one is the an anger that exists to change something. And then when that change happens, the anger resides. So it's not, and then the other is like a permanent anger. And a permanent anger, which is just where you live and where you're from and who you are all the time, that is not a healthy thing. It is not, uh, it's not really the scriptural type of anger that, um, that the, the scriptures broadly construed invite us into, but rather that, 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 that brief anger or that anger that is, um, in the words of, of the uh, Old Testament theologian Terry Fretheim, instrumental, that it, ex it exists as an instrument to change something. And then when the change happens, um, because it was just an instrument, it, uh, it resides. Um, so I, just to, I think that distinction broadly held is, is worth holding up. And then what we have to ask ourselves systemically, have we put some people in a place of hopelessness so that then they have no choice but to live out of a permanent anger? And that, that's the systemic piece to me. I do think that a Christian identity um, helps somebody not live in anger. So I'm, uh, I, I talk about this from time to time. So almost everybody knows this about me that listens. And that is that when I was a teenager, I had cancer, I had both legs amputated. And one of the things that I'm often asked by people is why aren't you angry? Or did you get angry? Where'd you're angry? And a lot of people that do become disabled permanently have a, are just angry. They're angry about the barriers that life faces. They're angry about the cards that have been dealt to them by life. And um, a, a Christian identity is what fostered in me the ability not, or not even the ability, it wasn't an ability, it was just a reality, not to, not to live permanently in anger about systemic oppression and, uh, and, and obstacles. And um, so I think when, I, when, when Jesus says, cat, you know, cast your burdens onto me, I will give you rest. Uh, my, my yoke is easy. To me, it's what he's saying is the identity, because of the relationship that I offer, um, you then have a relationship and a reality and identity that allows you to not be permanently 
um, hurting others or, uh, or stuck to, I guess stuck is uh, not get stuck. Think about that question in a couple of ways. Um, one is, um, and I sort of referenced this a couple of weeks ago, that um, in, in the midst of the reality, um, there's a word I want to say, and um, I'm I'm afraid to say it, and um, and then I have to remember um, why I'm trying to speak, and that the burden to get this out is not about me, but it's about the truth of the presence of the peace uh, that Jesus brings. And, and, and I like um, that that is, that is how uh, Jennifer Collin be begins her commentary, where she says, this, this is a text where Jesus is calling out a, a generation of people who doesn't recognize truth when it's standing right in front of them. Mm -hmm. and, and so pulling it back to, to uh, just the beginning of this reading, um, to what do I compare this generation? Um, I think not about the COVID situation, but a, as Matt leaned over to, um, but, I, but I think about the protests uh, and, and to start with the COVID reality. Um, at the beginning, we're told, stay at home. Okay, I did that and it didn't go away. So now I've lost my agency, you've limited my control and I want to protest. And, and, and I'm going to go and I'm going to stand on the courthouse steps. I'm going to stand on the front porch of the governor and say, you need to open things up and, and get things back out, uh, get things uh, the economy rolling again. Mm -hmm. And um, that's both sides. I did what I was supposed to do. And now I'm going to do what I want to do to get you to give me back what you took away from me. And on the side of the protesters for, uh, in, in light of the killing of, of black and brown uh, men and women, Colin Kaepernick took a knee and that was the wrong way to protest. Um, we walked down the street and that's the wrong way to protest. We riot and that's the wrong way to protest. And it's, it's an interesting parallel. And I know, Caroline, I'm doing what you said, be careful about doing, which is, is reading this text out of context, um, because you can make those parallels that I just made. But there also is this sense, as the commentary says, of truth is right there in front of this generation. And we refuse to see it. And if you don't recognize that having, um, that it is a burden to experience loss of agency. And if what I decide to, how I decide to respond to that is with anger, as we've talked about, and that anger turns into violence, um, that anger turns into retaliation, that anger turns into shutting out others. And, and I'm trying not to just talk about how black people respond, but how all people respond to whatever different burden they're carrying, um, or, if we will trust the presence and promise of God that says you might not go about this the way you think you're supposed to go about this. Go about it the way Christ went about it. Be willing to be vulnerable. Be willing to be peaceful. Be willing to forgive. And I promise you that burden will not be as difficult as the way that you've tried to go about it before. And that's, that's, that's my post-COVID, post-2020 reading of the text. Thanks for that, Carolyn. Well, I think it's just one of those verses that, I mean, there's a lot more, obviously, that, that preachers can think about this verse, but these verses, but I think it's a way, I, I, I think it's an invitation for a preacher to think, how am I hearing these verses this time around? Um, how might my congregation be hearing these verses? What are the what are the what are the ways in which they're um, uh, contextualizing um, these these words of Jesus in a in a really different different kind of time? Uh, just one more thing, and then we should probably move on. You know, one thing that I was really struck by those verses uh, is uh, the imperative. <laughs> um, you know, come to me. 
and uh, and um, take my yoke upon you. I mean, it's it's um, I kind of like that, even though I'm not a big fan. <laughs> but it's not like you know, if you want, think about it. You know, uh, you know, come to me or you know, consider taking my yoke upon you. I mean, some what what difference does it make that it's an that it that it is an imperative because at the end of the day we wouldn't um at the end of the day we you know do we actually trust god to um to go to god or do we actually trust god that god's yoke is um that god's yoke is good and kind um and the burden is small and so i think there's something there's i think there's all that there's also sort of an exposure of that human condition to say Left up, left to our own devices, we would um, uh, we would respectfully decline. Uh, and so, I think there's I think there's a kind of urgency in the imperative that I would also hold up this time. That this is not this is not. It might I mean you could say it's invitational. I'm not saying that it isn't, but there's a certain sort of yeah, do this because this is what the result is, and you really need to do this. So that's another thing I thought about. I like that. Is this uh, um, in the in the in the context of Matthew? Is this um, not a political, national, um, um, militaristic response, which is what they thought their Messiah was going to be? But the mission that we've talked about uh, mm. in previous weeks mm -hmm. the that it, that Jesus is displaying that is God's mission. Mm -hmm. Zechariah? Yeah, this is your big chance, anybody who's been excited to do Zechariah. We're starting a series on Zechariah that will last uh, one week, and it's Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. So, Normally an Advent or Christmas <laughs> text, correct? Um, or a Pop I'm, Sunday text. Yes. I thought it sounded familiar, like a donkey and a colt. I knew... I knew it. I knew that was in the Bible somewhere. Somewhere. Thank you for that, Rolf. So, <laughs> you know, okay, so this is July 4th weekend. This, it, it might be a really helpful text to, uh, along with the gospel to set alongside of, um, let's just say, one option for American identity, which is nationalistic, maybe racist, maybe militaristic. I'm not saying that's the only way to construe a certain uh, possibility put in front, but that here's another one that's spoken to an imprisoned people um, that this is saying your deliverer is coming. And, and I, here's what I love uh, uh, about this passage. Um, first of all, note the language is to cut off war. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from um, Jerusalem. And by the way, it doesn't say war horse in Hebrew, it just says horse. In, in the Old Testament, the horse is always the war horse, that people did not use the horse for either agricultural or transportation. It was strictly, it was strictly war. So the cutting off the chariot and the horse. Uh, and then there's, and then of course the bow and to bring peace. And then this crazy phrase, I will set your prisoners free from the water, uh, from the waterless pit, in, um, or just from the pit in this case, you know, a, a place where, um, just think about in a desert climate, being dug down like Joseph was thrown into a pit where there is no water. So waterless is okay, but really, you know, that you're in this dry place. And then it says this, I will um, return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. And that just struck me, prisoners of hope? They're imprisoned. What does that mean, prisoners of hope? It's changing the identity. Um, you are prisoners not of the Babylonian empire. You're prisoners of hope. And that's a good thing. I mean, what a crazy, strange flip of identity. So I think maybe that would be the uh, place I would hang the one week long series on Zechariah. And that, my friend, will preach. Thank you. Absolutely. And well, and this might be the weekend for it, like you said. 
And by the way, it's second Zechariah as opposed to first Zechariah, Matt, just, <laughs> just in case. Make a note of that for three years from now. That's good. It's to actually know. a one week series on second Zechariah. Okay, that's good to know. Can you help us with Genesis 24? Totally. All right, well, ready? Well, please do. So for the semi-continuous folks, um, right? So what? So after the near sacrifice of Isaac, Isaac grows up. His mother dies. Um, I can't remember if she dies before this. I think she does. But I can't remember off the top of my head. So now you've got an old man and a son, and he's unmarried. This is a, uh, in some ways, this story only moves, the purpose of this story is to move forward the story. Um, but this is about God has always sustained God's people. Here's yet another chapter, sometimes in huge, big ways, the deliverance at the Red Sea, the restoration from exile, sometimes in small ways, the birth of Isaac. Here, uh, Isaac's gaining of a wife, and that God always sustains the people. I think in the light of July 4th, that also preaches on the broader, uh, on the broader theme that um, we are still here, right? I mean, we are still here 4,000 years after this. God's people persists because of the fidelity of God. And for the record, uh, Sarah dies in chapter 23. I thought so. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And then, uh, by the way, um, Abraham remarries Keturah and has a bunch more kids. So this is really the point about this is Sarah's son. I mean, don't miss that. It is God's fidelity to Sarah, who's died, that is really being played out in this story. Okay, I like that. Okay, do you like that part? Karen? Yeah, that part was good. <laughs> that uh, part was good. <laughs> yeah, that there's fidelity to Sarah because otherwise, yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, um, the way that I, I don't know, the way that this, the, this, this gets in the lectionary is, you know, it's it, like you said, it moves the plot, and I get that. That's fine, but I, you know, get a wife for my son, and the way in which. Um, you know, the way in which Rebecca is, um, shall I say, objectified or becomes like, you know, a means He's to procured. an end. Procured. Procured, yes, right. and, um, and objectified. And um, not a big fan, but. Actually, okay, look, can I stop and say there that Isaac has no agency. Rebecca does. So they have to send a Limelech. So Isaac is like yeah. this big nothing, and Rebecca, she actually, uh, I, I, I think she actually has some chutzpah here in the story. So I would point that out. Um, yeah, yeah, I get that. I, but I, I, what I, I do appreciate though that phrase of, uh, of a, of God being, um, yeah, God being faithful to Sarah, and I think that that, I think that, that's something I could preach. <laughs> And it lends itself to the song. Ooh, nice move. <laughs> Bring it home. Yeah. Sing of your steadfast love. Yeah. Even yeah. though, just for the record, that the, that the song that goes with, the psalm that goes with this story uh, in the lectionary, in the, in the semi-continuous lectionary is Psalm 45, which I didn't even look up, but I think that's the wedding song. That's the, the royal psalm of wedding. I got to look it up now, which is cray cray because that's probably the only time that psalm ever comes up. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, so anytime you can work Psalm 45, which never ever occurs elsewhere, uh, which is, uh, it's a royal psalm about the king getting married, you know, and I really have nothing good to say about that psalm other than that. Isn't Abraham like 140 in this story also when we get to this point? Pretty much. I think, I think he's got uh, only three uh, wheels left on his walker. So Sarah does die imagining my 140-year-old spouse being taken care of by like my 35-year-old son. Something like that. Okay. Jesus but it, I mean, she has died. So she has died and not seen 
I mean, I think one of the big themes of Genesis 12 through 20 is God's fidelity to the promise to Sarah. Because Abraham goes, says, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight, you know? And God's like, no, 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 no. This isn't about you. It's about my promise to Sarah. And so I think that is really picked up and is important. And that's why, without getting into what Paul does in Romans three and Galatians, uh, Romans four and Galatians three, that Paul really does understand it's about God's promise to Sarah. But that's a whole other thing. Let's close up. We are past point. Um, Romans chapter seven. My it's, guess is this is about sin. <laughs> <laughs> that would be correct. It is about sin. Uh, yeah. It's also about something else that we talked about, loss of agency, which is a term that's come up as well, right? What does it mean to be stripped of your agency by sin? Not as a way of saying, well, the devil made me do it. I have no responsibility, but as a way of saying, uh, sin finds a way to uh, enlist you in its services. Even, you know, and this is a conversation I've been in uh, a dozen of these in the last five days about talking about just how difficult it is to acknowledge that good, well-meaning moral people can inhabit evil systems uh, and contribute to those systems and be malformed by those systems. And it's easy to, to admit that and to say that out loud. It's hard to actually start uncovering the places where that exists um, as an individual and as, as a church or society or a community. That's not the only thing Paul is talking about here, but I see it totally commensurate with that. It's hard to hear, it's hard to face, but it's just, here is a text that opens that door for you. What does it mean to be sold under sin? Uh, read verses 13 and 14, and we should talk about adding verses, but that, and what does that look like? It's not so much about my own moral struggle. This is about sin's capacity to use something like the law to make me sin even more. This is a strange ad, um, but if folks are in need of some light reading that I think does a wonderful job of exposing what these verses are about, uh, it's an old book by Frank Peretti, of all people, and it's called The Oath. And it is a powerful, in my opinion, it is a powerful display of the capacity of sin to uh, compel us and, and us to just fall in line with that. I think it's a brilliant metaphor for, for sin that this particular text um, is talking about.